have uh, the slide for the start. I will be grateful. Thank you so much. Perfect. So this is uh, the EDEM, the Association of European Distance and E-Learning Network webinar, part of the Open Education Week, which is happening this week, in fact, globally. And uh, we have uh, webinars every day at around 1 or 3 p.m. Uh, based on uh, Central European time. But today we have two webinars. This is the first webinar. And this is the webinar which is dealing about open education technologies. And if you are tweeting or sharing uh, information which you can see here or find during this webinar, we will very much appreciate if you can use the hashtags which are below and uh, Eden handle so we can identify what everybody is saying around the world. So thank you so much for coming to everybody who is here. And I just want to remind you why we choose this topic. Technology is playing a very important role in the education nowadays. In fact, we can say a tremendous role. And in the um, European Union Erasmus Plus project, which is led by the University College London, by the Knowledge Lab from the University College London, we have developed an ABC to VLE learning uh, wheel, which relates with all the tools which exist nowadays in the use of your education. And we found over 500, which is amazing. And part of this, part of this, quite a, a lot of them, are in fact open education technologies. And we are very happy to have Martin Dojiamas here from Moodle, who is going to present us about the open educational technologies movement and uh, uh, how to say, the blueprint which he is uh, leading. I'm Diane Andone, for everybody to, to know me. I'm coming from Romania, from the Politecnica University of Timisoara in Romania. And we have very interesting speakers today. We have two CEOs and founders, which is Martin Georgiamas from Moodle, coming directly from Perth, Australia, and also Svein Torgrif with the founder of H5P, which is coming from Norway. We also have Doug Belshaw from the Moodle Net, which is uh, a new network for educators and students. We have Professor Alfredo Soero from University of Porto, who is my colleague in the Eden Executive Committee. And we have Professor Carmen Holopescu coming again from Timshara. So you will see a lot of interesting presentations. But uh, let's not uh, lose the time. I just want to start with uh, Martin's presentation. These two slides are for the end. So, Martin, the floor is yours, and until uh, we upload Martin's uh, slide, let me say something about Martin. Martin uh, is the founder and the CEO of Moodle. Moodle is the tool which almost everybody in the university is used as the uh, for learning, for supporting learning as a learning management system, even if, if he doesn't like that Moodle is told <laughs> to be a learning management system. We still consider and we label it like that in the research mainly. And he's a very good friend of mine. And this is just a tip. If you are coming to Timisoara to the Eden conference in June, you will be able to see and shake his hand in person and even take a photo with him. He's very friendly. So Martin, the floor is yours. Are we still allowed to shake hands these days? I think there might be a, 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 a might change. Well, anyway, I would love, I'm looking forward to being there. Thank you, Diana, and thank you for the invite. Eden is something I've known about and been involved with on the edges for a long time, but I, I don't really think I've spent much time, you know, in an Eden event like this. So it's a pleasure. Um, so uh, I, obviously, I'm, I'm just going to give you a bit of background about Moodle because people have different impressions about it, and I want to explain what's happening there. Um, now, our mission has not changed in a long time. We're here to empower educators and to improve our world specifically. Um, we're very strong uh, supporters of our values and we try and uh, talk about them and push them every time we can. And what we're trying to build, our vision is to build the, the most effective platform. And effective is a, a balance between quality and cost, um, the efficient. Um, 
And we are very, you know, obviously education is a basic human right. I know a lot of you uh, know that, but it's something that should be said and it's important actually uh, as I go forward. Um, if you have a basic human right, you need to give it strong foundations and there needs to be things that we can trust. The word trust is very important. So I'm going to very quickly just pretend we're we'll give you a little metaphor here of some things I've been thinking about. Imagine this is Star Wars. You know, I assume you've seen Star Wars, and here we live on this planet. Um, that the Galactic Empire, as I see it, is the the movement of profit obsessed companies. We have these giant companies that are growing and becoming trillion dollar companies um, that do not mind destroying planets like ours. Uh, and a lot of the problems that we have uh, are caused by you know, greed, ultimately. Um, I'm not going to talk about these, but um, maybe in, the, in the, um, the Emperor Palpatine of this universe is these large tech companies that, that are seeking to control, right? They want to control things. And as a, as a general rule, uh, that doesn't go well, having um, uh, large controlling entities like this focused on profits. So I see it as, as part of the resistance, rebels, um, Creative Commons, Open Source, Open Education Global, Eden, UNESCO, um, and o Open Education Resources in general. Um, I'm going to put Moodle as Luke Skywalker, why not? Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is fly around the universe and uh, of the Earth here and, and fix some things. I'll get back to that metaphor later. This is the picture of Moodle right now. Um, Moodle has is a lot of uh, use around the world. These are all of the different um, continents and large regions. Uh, Moodle is predominantly used you know, everywhere. Um, the only place where it has uh, stiff competition is in, the, in North America. And uh, this red company, for example, spends $100 million a year just on marketing. Um, that's way, way bigger than like our total budget at Moodle, for example. So um, that's, that's where we are. What this means is we have a huge community um, of users, and some of you may be using Moodle. Um, but around the world, uh, we have many hundreds of thousands of people who support what we're doing in open education in general. We have good parties sometimes too. Um, so we're trying to build this ship, right? So let me let me uh, talk about the, the future of what the ship will be flying around in. Um, we are facing some quite scary futures right, as a planet. Um, the world is kind of shrinking. Here we are, I'm in Australia, but I'm talking to you now. Um, we have more data than ever, real and fake. And artificial intelligence is controlling systems. It's starting to guide us in our choices. It's giving us the options before we ask for them. Um, and those AIs are often can controlled by algorithms from these companies I was talking about before. Um, there was an artificial intelligence algorithm last year, a new neural net, that you can give it one sentence and it can finish the article. It can write a whole article. And when you read the article as a human, you go, well, that could be true. Um, it's quite an amazing thing. So with all of this data and all of these AIs and all of this um, stuff going on, issues are getting very complex. It's kind of hard for anybody to know. It's very it's interesting right now, say with coronavirus. Now, we, what we need is like uh, scientific information. We need education at a global level. And instead, if you see what's being passed around on, on social media and, um, and many other places, there's a lot of nonsense. People selling products that you don't need, right? Because, oh, they're, they're taking advantage of this situation. Um, so all of us are struggling, and I think we're all feeling it, uh, an overload every day. So if we're looking at the world, uh, these are the SDG problems that we're facing. How does a population that is struggling under an information overload um, cope with a, uh, these problems? How are we going to solve these problems if we don't have a good handle on what's true or not, if we don't understand the, the ramifications of things. Um, 
it's easy to go down to the local store and buy a lot of things. But if you don't have an education that helps you understand, well, by buying this thing, I'm having an impact on another part of the world or the ecosystem that I live in, um, then uh, you know we're, we're leading ourselves into further problems. So the future lies in the quality of education, and it's this keyword quality um, that we that I think we need to focus more on. Um, this, someone when they converted this slide uh, must have killed it. But what is it, what it actually says is that uh, universities should uh, uh, should model a better world. I'd love to see education institutions um, not separate research from teaching, but research their teaching more, like as the main thing. Um, they should be. We should be in our universities looking at how should how can democracy be better? How can we work together more effectively? How can we um, separate real news from fake news and these kinds of things? Now people say it's quite hard to do, but this is the alternative. The alternative is if if we as the educators don't solve these problems, the big companies are going to solve them for us, and they're going to solve them in ways that we may not like in the future. If the whole, if your only option in the future is to is the, to run a university, is the software comes from one single big company, and when you switch on the university in the morning, that logo is all over the the, the, the company, all over the institution. Um, that's not a good future. That's not a future I want for my children and my children's children. So I'm very focused in what I'm doing. Um, uh, not only obviously Moodle, but like is a wider problem. How do we get the world's best educators and students working and learning together? Well, the only way I know how to do it, and the only way I can think of to do it, is with open technology and communities. So it brings us to open ed tech and the, that concept that Diana mentioned. Um, so the idea is for open education technology is uh, investing in the common good and building um, a infrastructure for the world. And I want to give you a couple of little um, facts that might help you see how this makes sense. This first one is I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of EduRome. EduRome is a um, system used globally as you can see here so that if you have a uh, username and password on any institution in this network, when you go to another one you can log straight in. And I have an account uh, when I sometimes I'm walking down a street, I could be in New York or I could be in Sri Lanka, and I look at my phone and it's on Wi-Fi. And due to the magic of Eduro, this is a beautiful little piece of ed tech that's very very low investment, very very low maintenance. Um, it's maintained uh, as a small project in uh, Giant, or Giant, the network in Europe. Uh, but the whole globe benefits, and this is the kind of thing I'm, I'm talking about, these nice small pieces of ed tech. Um, another really uh, good thing to, to point out, if you haven't already heard, is that the UNESCO in November, this slide's been a bit messed up again, um, that UNESCO in November made a recommendation, uh, which is a very strong recommendation. It's actually the result of every country in the world, except for the US, and maybe Trinidad and Tobago or something, um, have said uh, unanimously, we want to support open education resources. Um, and now all of these countries are starting to develop supportive policies, which means moving money uh, away from textbooks and commercial uh, solutions towards open education resources, which is just like the best news ever. Um, it means there's going to be a lot more funding for these open things because there's not only the OER, but like where do you put the OER? How do you make the OER? How do you curate that stuff? And Doug's going to talk about one one thing later. So um, we started Open Ed Tech as a way to get people together who are interested in building these technologies um, and uh, uh, working together to produce a um, a fairly standardised kind of model, a platform, an infrastructure for the next 100 years. And we say 100 years because that gets everybody thinking beyond 
you know, a grants project or the next three-year plan, if you think a hundred years, you're starting to think about, you know, humans as a species living on the planet. What's the best way for us to be learning and teaching our next generations? So we had a meeting. Um, uh, this is a photo of uh, some of us who were there at the end. Uh, we had two full days um, hard work. There were some um, good projects who came along. There were some uh, professors who came along uh, from various places. We had the Open Education Consortium represented. We had um, uh, some, some other products, and, and it was just a really good time. We I got everyone working pretty hard. Um, and we, we did a lot of brainstorming and we came down to a couple of things I want to quickly run through. So the first thing is a, a list, uh, it's a bit hard to read this, but a, um, a list of what we thought were our principles and that has to help us guide everything else. So there is education as a basic human right. Open EdTech is the best solution for it. Uh, we want open standards, we want interoperability. We want the control of ed education technology to be collectively shared as much as it possibly can be. Um, we want to em empower educators. We want education to drive the technology. Um, so uh, it's some of the things that we came up with in that two days, uh, we prioritise these things. And I love all of the things in this list um, uh, that really helps us decide what to do. So then, then we decided to work on what are our focus areas and things that we want to work on. So there are six things in this list. Um, the, the first one here is um, building a global education cloud. Now this is looking for ways to connect machines, to connect servers, to produce a kind of a general use cloud for education that, you know, if you imagine every university put in one server, um, and they were running something like, just like EduRome does, a standard piece of software, if they were running some software that allowed all the servers to function together as a cloud, we could easily build, fairly easily, build something that was comparative to you know, Google Cloud or um, uh, AWS or something like that, but it would be owned by the education institutions. Um, the, on the, the purpose of building that is that now you have a platform that you can trust for a hundred years. And on top of that platform you can start building um, systems for global recognition, badges and things like that. Now you have a place to store them. Um, you can build uh, this idea of a globally idea bank, which I haven't got time to tell you about, but is a, a, a terrific idea. Um, you can, um, we're also very interested in focusing on interoperability standards. So the Open EdTech group are not there to create new standards, but we are there to push standards that we think make sense, uh, to highlight things that are good, and, um, and so on. And, and finally, what we want to do is be a catalyst for change. So we want to start thinking about how do we show people that joining the Open EdTech um, uh, infrastructure is a good idea um, and uh, that it's going to be a win-win for everybody. And that's, I find it easy to talk about it, but I think we institutions take time to change. So uh, come to the website, it's openedtech.global, uh, I think the link's in the chat. Um, from there there's some early discussion forums started very recently where we're starting to discuss those things I just mentioned. Please come and join us. Uh, we're looking for some people to help lead these working groups. And uh, if you're interested, just come along and tune in. It's a Moodle site uh, at the moment. So if we go back to Star Wars, uh, what we're trying to build here is a, a kind of um, uh, a group within all the resistance, something like a, a Jedi Council, right? where instead of uh, using the force, we're using the source. So um, uh, that, that's what, what's happening here. Everybody's welcome. Um, we'd love you to join in. And really, this is the goal. We have this tiny planet, right? We, we need to decide how we're going to connect all these people together in the best possible way. And uh, that's me for right now. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to have any Thank questions. Thank you so much, Martin. That was very interesting and very challenging, I can say. 
and uh, maybe for a lot of uh, our participants, uh, quite new information about the open ed tech uh, global movement. And we are really looking forward to get involved as many people as possible. You already have a question there, but before we answer to that question, I also have a very quick question for you. We have one or maximum two minutes for questions now because we are running a bit late. Um, basically, is what do you see as the major, major challenge for the adoption of open education technologies by the university? Well, uh, we don't have big marketing budgets. Uh, we don't have salespeople who go and talk to the vice chancellors. We don't have those sorts of things. So it's a community driven thing and we need the community to help. And um, uh, we need support. Uh, there's another question further down. Someone's asking about usability and accessibility in Moodle. Those happen to be our two top projects and our two top priorities at the moment. But uh, to get those, that sort of work done in Moodle costs money. Uh, we have to find that money. A lot of people who use Moodle don't pay for Moodle. Right? We don't charge for Moodle. Um, and uh, so we have a lot of people saying, oh, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And we go, well, we're trying our best with what we have. So we need the support of the community. We need the community to support these sorts of things. If you believe that open software and open education technology and open education are good things, please try and make your institutions support them financially in some way because that's how we have the energy uh, to employ developers, to employ experts, to employ all the people yeah. it takes you to get things done. Also some questions there which so, you yeah. can also answer by texting. But I will pick only yes, uh, I can I will pick only answer only one which is from coming from the former president of Eden Irina Volontivicien, yeah, which is saying that where we can find uh, the tools and the everything, the resources for teachers and students. And I think Doug has the answer for that because that's what uh, MoodleNet is uh, for. So if we can have uh, Moodle, uh, Doug, uh, slide please, Dora, thank you. And I will just briefly introduce Doug until then, which is uh, coming from, uh, in fact, he's coming from Motila Foundation. He was very, very keen and uh, an evangelist on open badges before. This is how I first knew about Doug and he's now in charge with uh, Moodle Net, which is a Moodle network, Moodle based network for resources, which is dedicated to teachers and students. So, um, Doug, the floor is yours. And Martin, if you can answer some questions in the chat, I will really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Diana, and thanks, uh, Martin. So yeah, I've been working for the last couple of years on, on MoodleNet, taking it from an idea that Martin had and I'm just trying to flesh it out. So I'm hoping in the next 12 minutes or so to kind of share where we're at um, with our kind of small part-time team and the kind of strides we've made forward um, recently. So I'm going to go quite quickly. I do apologize firstly for my accent um, and also for the speed in which I'll go. I have pre-recorded this presentation and put it on Twitter and you can also get my slides um, via Eden. Okay. So at Moodle, our mission is to empower educators to improve our world. And that is kind of runs through everything that we do. And so that's where MoodleNet has come from, really. You'll be used to Moodle LMS, which is the core thing that is used by over 175 million people around the world. But you also might be familiar with the Moodle app, Moodle Cloud, um, the new service, which is Moodle Workplace, which you can get through Moodle Partners, um, the MEC program, Moodle Educator Certification, and now MoodleNet, and that might be the one that you're least familiar with because we haven't quite launched it yet. So I'm going to go through five things. I'm going to go through quite quickly. I do apologize if English isn't in your first uh, language, that if I go too quickly, um, my apologies for that. We've got lots to get through. But I want to go through what MoodleNet is, who it's for, how it helps, how it works, and uh, what's next for us as a team. So first of all, what is MoodleNet? Well, we know that Moodle LMS is a private space for teaching and learning, and that's exactly what we want. We want those spaces to be private for those interactions between um, teachers and students and student to student. Um, but all of these educators have these great ideas and resources. So where do they go to share those? Well, the idea is that they go to, to MoodleNet, and that's the place for discussions um, and to share resources. 
So ModalNet, in a nutshell, is a space, an open social media platform where you can share open content and engage in professional development. And the idea behind that is that we're going to improve the quality of education by having the kind of impact we've had through Moodle LMS over the last 17 years. So who is MoodleNet for? Well, it's people like you and your colleagues. So educators, learning technologists, um, trainers in corporate organizations, teaching assistants, and also systems administrators who are kind of caught between um, outsourcing and kind of keeping things private. So all of these people have a stake and an interest in, in MoodleNet, I would say. Now, when we did this original research, when we tried to figure out what it was that educators needed, all of those icons that you can see on the right hand side, those logos, they were the kind of things that came up in our research. And the challenges that educators had were around finding where they had a conversation that they previously had before, and also finding resources that they'd come across and couldn't quite find again. But also um, having those places separate from their LMS and really struggling to kind of link those two places where they're being social and finding resources with the LMS um, and getting things into to Moodle. So we found that really when we boiled down those needs, it was to do with discovering and sharing high quality ideas and openly licensed resources, making sure that those resources could be easily reused and legally reused, um, adding those to courses and engaging in discussions with a shared context. And what I mean by that is that it's not just putting a tweet out and hoping that someone relevant is going to respond, but it's having communities of people who you know do the same kind of things as you do and have that shared context. So that's where we kind of began. Um, and our hypothesis behind MoodleNet is that educators don't just need a better Google um, because learning is actually social. If you think about it, search engines require that you know what you're looking for already. Um, you have to type something in, whereas sometimes you discover things via serendipity. And also individual resources exist within a wider context. I used to be a teacher and you never just use one resource for a lesson. You tend to use a range of resources over the, you know, a, a lesson, a course, a scheme of work. So those exist within a wider context and we wanted to make sure that that wider context was available too. So how does MoodleNet help? Well, before I show you some, some screenshots, um, it helps educators, but because it helps educators by, um, they want to find teaching and learning resources that are high quality, which are openly licensed, so they don't spend ages searching Google and open education repositories. It helps learning technologists because they are trying to empower their colleagues um, and they can connect their colleagues with other like-minded people easily through MoodleNet and they don't have to endlessly search OER repositories. It helps systems administrators who, are, as I said before, are caught between outsourcing and providing spaces which are either locked down or fully public. MoodleNet is going to allow a bit of both. And then finally, it helps trainers and teaching assistants who want to showcase what they've done and also support educators so they can have professional profiles and also share their achievements and resources. So we're really trying to serve the needs of educators and all of the people that we work with. So we began a couple of years ago and from the beginning we designed MoodleNet as a place which would sustainably empower communities of educators to share and learn from one another. So communities are at the heart of, of MoodleNet. Communities of people coming together to curate collections of resources and engage in professional development. So last year some of you might have been involved in this. Um, this was the kind of value testing proposition, testing the value proposition of MoodleNet. Um, and we, we tested it out and people really liked the idea, but what we found was that the interface was a bit confusing. So we actually completely rewrote the back end and front end of MoodleNet, and it's now in a much better position. So when you log into MoodleNet, what you see is this. Um, and this is, this is live now, these are screenshots, but this is live and we're about to start um, testing on this um, again. You see the Discover tab, you see Featured Collections and Communities, and you see everything that's being shared on your instance. The thing I haven't mentioned so far, which I'll go into a bit of detail in a moment, is that MoodleNet is federated. Um, Moodle LMS are completely separate private sites. MoodleNet, out of the box, is federated. They're connected together, which means that you can join communities on any instance around the world, any organization, any university. So these are featured collections and communities, and these are the updates at the bottom around um, the things which are happening on in your university, in your organization. And then on my MoodleNet, this other tab, these are all of the communities that you've joined, the collections that you're following, and the people that you're following. So like a social media feed, in reverse chronological order. So you can get updates on the things that you care about. 
When you go into a community, like this one called The Lounge, you can see the tabs say recent activities and collections and discussions. So communities curate collections of resources, and those collections are really powerful and really the, the building blocks of, of MoodleNet. So let's just go into a collection. This particular one is spaced repetition within the community instructional design and higher education. And you can see that you can share resources here by adding a link, like a bookmark, to somewhere you found on the internet, or you can add a new resource. If you share a link, then what MoodleNet does is it goes out and gets all the information and brings it back for you. So you don't have to type in loads of information. It adds the title and the description and the image. Um, and then when you put it into MoodleNet, there it is, really easy to add. And you've basically added a bookmark for other people to find within a collection of other relevant resources. Um, likewise, we're going to improve the user interface here. But when you add a resource, you can upload the resource, add a name and a description and an image. And you can choose one of three Creative Commons licenses. And we're using what Creative Commons call free culture licenses here to really make those resources as open as possible. Now, when you go into, um, into here, into the collection, you can see now that that resource has been added. We've got one added by link. And we've got one added by upload with the Creative Commons license showing. And if I go to search now, when I search, I'm not just searching my own instance of MoodleNet. I'm searching the entire network because you connect your MoodleNet instance to a, a, a mothership, a, a kind of a search index. And I can join communities on any instance and engage in those conversations no matter where I am in the world and follow collections too. So here's my profile. You can see that um, you, the communities that I've joined, the collections that I'm following, the things that I've liked, the people that I'm following. And this is a bit of a serendipity engine too. You can see that I'm a, an administrator of this in, instance. Um, MoodleNet is already localized into several languages. Um, the one that I'll just show you here is, is Arabic. Obviously, Arabic is right to left. So MoodleNet is already working um, in RTL, which is great. I've mentioned federation, and this is perhaps the most complex thing about MoodleNet. We've tried to make it really easy to use, but it's very powerful behind the scenes. It's a federated social network. So you use a federated network every day. It's called email. And the reason that email works everywhere is because it's built on those open standards that Martin was talking about before. If you tried, for example, to send a message from Twitter to Facebook, it wouldn't work because they're not built on open standards. But email is. You don't have to think about the email that I sent to Diane. Is it going to work? Um, yeah, because Diana, well, of course, it's going to work because Diana is using an, uh, an email standard um, uh, uh, standards system. So for social networks now, there is now an open standard called ActivityPub. So here is Martin. He's on his home instance of MoodleNet, but he can join communities anywhere on any MoodleNet instance. Um, An ActivityPub is brought to us by the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. And they work on the standards for the web. So ActivityPub is an official spec. Um, it's used by things like Mastodon and Pleroma and PeerTube and PixelFed and all these other social networks too. So we're not the first people to be using this. And there are millions of, of users using these decentralized social networks. Uh, it's important to note that, you know, like on Twitter and stuff, your, you know, Martin's username is at Moodler. Mine's at DAJ Belshaw. But on, on MoodleNet, it needs to be a bit longer. It has to have the instance there as well. And the reason it has to have the instance there is because it's like email. You, you're somewhere on the entire network. So that's an interesting thing to, to point out there. We're going to, well, we've already got a mothership, this search index of publicly available MoodleNet data. If you connect your, your MoodleNet instance to the mothership, as we hope pretty much everyone will, then you'll be able to search across all of those MoodleNet instances which make up the network. And we're expecting there to be thousands uh, of MoodleNet instances in a couple of years' time. MoodleNet is, of course, open source using the AGPL license. Now, I haven't got time to go into how AGPL is different to GPL, but um, do look it up. We're trying to make sure that this is for the long term, for the 100 years, like Martin talked about, open source and sustainable. So um, I'm going to skip this in terms of advantages of federated systems. Do look those up. If federation is new to you, um, please do have a look. I'm going to instead focus on um, the, the technology and where we're going next. So MoodleNet uses Elixir on the back end. Elixir is a very scalable technology, which comes from telecommunications. Um, so it's not PHP. And on the front end, we are going to be, well, we are using JavaScript, React. And between the two, we're using GraphQL as a query language. Now, the advantage of that is that it's very customizable on the front end, very scalable on the back end. And you can also make lots of different queries if the way that we've designed MoodleNet isn't exactly for your use case. 
Um, in terms of what's next for MoodleNet, well, we um, have some priorities. Our priorities are around community, sustainability, making sure that it's localized, um, making sure that MoodleNet's really flexible for different situations, um, and also making sure that it's private where it needs to be. Um, in terms of the, the kind of technology adoption curve, we're at the stage of, of early adoption here. So the people who come along to Eden webinars like this are the kind of people who would set up their own instance, who would be um, tinkering with MoodleNet and joining us in our federation testing, which is starting very soon. So in the next few weeks, we'll be launching federation testing. Uh, we're just finishing off some work to, to get that started. Then we'll be starting user testing on Moodle HQ run instances. Um, LMS integration is on the slate for Moodle 3.9. And then we'll have a version 1.0 release, um, hopefully in May. Um, after that, well, there's a load of things we want to do. We're very ambitious. We want to make sure that we've got all of the things that you'd expect from a social network and also go further to be very focused on social networks for educators, because obviously educators have to reappropriate what um, big tech use them, um, just give them quite often. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, my team. Uh, there's myself, Mael, Alessandro, Karen, James, and Ivan, all based in different parts of Europe as a remote team. Um, I'd also like to thank, oh, this slide has gone crazy, but um, Antonis and Katerina. Um, there's a Moodle partner called Yumina who have been supporting us uh, with some development time. And also Martin, that, that has gone very strange. But um, Martin, um, who you know, Sonder, who's head of the LMS team, uh, Carlo from a data protection point of view, Tassos from Yumina, and of course the Moodle Users Association, which you should all join if you haven't already. And then just lots and lots of people who have been involved in idea, ideation, testing, um, giving ideas, everything like that. So if you're interested in MoodleNet, you can email me, Doug, D-O-U-G, at Moodle.com, or you can email moodle.moodlenet-moderators at Moodle.com, which will go to me and to Mayel, who might be able to answer your technical questions. So I'm going to leave it there, and hopefully I'll fit into the 12 minutes which uh, Diana has allocated. Cheers. Thank you very much, Doug. That was perfect. And I think you just answered some of the questions which people had in their mind in the recent years, because I kept hearing quite a lot how we can exchange easier information and resources among the guys, because we all have all of these OR repositories, but uh, they're quite difficult to use, and especially to transfer, uh, how to say, fields and uh, documents and metadata also between our platforms. So thank you for this, and uh, I really hope we will be able to join it soon. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have one small question for you until uh, we will have uh, the slides for the next presenter getting ready. My question is basically is that what do you see is the largest, the, or to say the, the, the challenging, let's make it again challenging, problem for Moodle to really catch up, to really become known? And don't say again like marketing, marketing problems. <laughs> <laughs> no, the biggest um, problem around any federated social network is understanding what federation means and the fact that you can own your own data, but also connect it with other people as well. Because we're so used to either a centralized platform like Twitter and Facebook or private spaces. And so federation is somewhere in between where you own your own data, but you also connect to other people. And that's why I use email as an example. So that's the way that we've designed MoodleNet, I would say, is to try and make it so that you don't really have to understand on a technical basis how federation works. You just get all of the advantages of that via being able to join communities and other instances and being able to search for resources across the entire network. So we really have to try, we have tried to minimize the, the amount of technical knowledge you need to know. Um, but I guess that, as ever, is always going to be the, the main barrier. Thank you very much, Doug. And now we are getting uh, ready for Zwein Talk with uh, Wester. I'm, I'm, I really hope, Zwein Talk, that I managed to say your name uh, better than in the last years. <laughs> I'm trying to learn as much as I can. And who is, in fact, going uh, to present about H5P, which I need to say is the tool which I really love. I was looking so much to have a tool like this in the last years. We are an engineering and technical university, and we love to be able to have some interactions or some drawings or questions or chat or anything on top of videos to, to make them more challenging and more resourceful for our students. He is used to be known Falcon, but I think he will still we will still catch with Vine Tor if we can. And uh, he is a 
huge advocate of OS and he'd been working for his entire life, in fact, in open source uh, software. So Zvanko, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. And uh, hi there, everyone. So I'm uh, very pleased to um, be able to talk to you guys. And uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, Diana. I'm, I'm glad you like H5P. Uh, this presentation is slightly different than uh, planned. I, was, I usually present with H5P. H5P has its own presentation tool, uh, but uh, it, uh, I can't share my screen here, so I have to use PowerPoints. Um, but we'll be okay. So I'll give you a quick intro to H4P and, and talk a little bit about our next steps. So H4P, our um, main goal is to change the world of interactive content a little bit. We see it as still quite med medieval. Um, and the reason for that is a lot of the content is being created from scratch every time. So uh, um, uh, whenever you create, for instance, a resource about uh, the COVID-19 virus, uh, democracy, or whatever it might may be, there are probably other people working on the same. And for many things, there are tons of resources already available online. So what H4P aim to do is make, uh, make it super simple to find those resources that are available in the world. And, Instead of creating a new one from scratch, you can either use an existing one uh, as is, or you can uh, um, uh, take an existing one, translate it, improve it, make it yours, and then use that for your student. And you may also choose to share your resources with the rest of the world. Uh, when you listen to Doug's presentation, they are doing some of the same things. And we are um, exploring good ways of, of uh, working with Moodle also on that part of Moodle. So with MoodleNet, the focus is a lot on social, uh, social media, social interaction communities, H4P, we are a plugin. So we plug into different publishing systems. Uh, we are an authoring tool uh, and we make the system able to produce better content. So for us, the repository is not a part of a social media system. It's part of our authoring tool. So yeah, that's a bit about H4P. Make it super easy to reuse interactive content. How do we do this? So H4P is open source, of course. It has to be uh, not only to make it free. Free is maybe the least important uh, property. Uh, ideally, we would uh, to uh, have our uh, for users, those with less resources, they shouldn't contribute to us at, at all. And we'd wish that we could kind of tax the, the rich organizations and people using H4P so that we also have the energy to, to move the project forward as fast as possible. But we are open source because it's safe. So as long as people are happy with us, they'll continue using us and if they stop being happy, they, they can still use us until they find a better, better system. So it's very safe for people to use us. What happened to Flash uh, wouldn't have happened if it had been real open source. Uh, Apple could have just um, changed it the way they needed it to be changed, and then they could kept using it on iPads and, and iPhones. So being open source, uh, if you put all your content into an open source solution, it's a very, very safe place to have your content. And it also fosters collaboration. It allows you to customize um, all parts of, of the tool and the content. And we are a plugin, so we're not our own site. We don't need to, um, we don't need marketing. We don't need to try to make people go to a special website to use our tool. They can just plug us in wherever they are. So if you're using Moodle or Canvas or Blackboard or, WordPress or Drupal, um, there are now coming HVP plugins to almost every system there is. Uh, so, so we can spread super fast. We don't have to, uh, we can just plug into whatever people are already using. It makes us spread very quickly. And obviously quality. So uh, in the old days at least, open source initiatives had a tendency to 
be very programmer focused and driven and not so much user experience. At HPP, we have always had uh, a lot of emphasis on the user experience, on making sure that everything is user tested, uh, trying to make things super intuitive, pleasant, and thrilling to use. So those three, three things are what we focus on to spread H4P as a standard. So where should you use H4P? Well, we, we uh, focus on uh, making the, the adoption curve, the learning curve, as easy as possible. So a teacher can easily just start using H4P without much training. There are no lock-in. They're not locked into Moodle or Canvas or Drupal or whatever you're using. If you switch your publishing system, you can just move your content over and it will work the same way and you can continue editing the same way. And it's plug and play, super easy. Uh, in terms of traction, we've seen tremendous growth since we started. We've been tripling the amount of users every year. Um, this graph stops on 2019. In 2020, we were integrated in the core of Moodle, which means that every Moodle site in the world has H4P. So obviously, if we continue this graph uh, 2020, it would be growing even more. The community is super global, so we have lots of views in the Americas. And South America is just as big as North America here, so very popular in the Americas, Europe. In Australia also, Australia doesn't have that much population, so it's only 6%, but uh, more than half the universities in, in Australia use H5P. And we've started to grow in Asia. Because of languages there, we are a little bit behind. But uh, it's, it's coming. India, for instance, every state in India uses uh, H4P now in some of the biggest uh, learning environments there. So we now have huge adoptions. We have uh, tons of people, millions of authors, uh, hundreds of thousands of websites with H4P access. So what's the next step? The next step for us is to bring all of this together. So right now we see thousands of times every day uh, that uh, people are um, moving content between different systems. You have universities on Blackboard collaborating with universities on Moodle, and they're sending HPPs back and forth, altering a little bit there, a little bit there. Uh, it's nice to see, but we want to make that a whole lot smoother. So right now you need to kind of know where to find the resources you want to use. We'll be connecting all our hundreds and thousands of websites and uh, connect them through something called H4P Hub. And it will allow um, our users to easily share their work with the entire world. And also, obviously, search, uh, search a global repository of content to see what exists already. So if you want to create an interactive uh, video, you can go in go from your own altering tool. You can just start typing, and we'll be searching our hub to see if we have uh, a video um, about what you are about to create and potentially save you tens of hours of work if it already exists. Uh, if you start creating an interactive video and you want to add a multiple choice task uh, within the video, you can do the same. So you can go from within the interactive video and start searching for things to add to the video. So you can find entire resources and you can also find uh, partial resources uh, from the hub. Uh, and when you find things, everything is integrated, so, so uh, you don't have to think about copyright or anything, because all of that will be in place for you. Just pick the resource, and we make sure that all attribution and all that stuff is handled. And uh, eventually, we'll also give you warnings if you, for instance, uh, pick a non-commercial image and put it into a video uh, that is uh, is to be used commercially. The system will warn you and tell you that no, this uh, this can't be done because you have a non-commercial image. So we've been spending all these years until now to build 
unaltering tool with huge adoption. And what we'll do next is bring them all together and create a global collaboration system for interactive content so that uh, the content repository is part of your authoring tool. So we're very, very excited about that. We're working on it and uh, very much uh, look forward to launching it. Yeah, so summed up, big problem we're solving that you're creating from scratch every time. We want to help people um, make the default not creating from scratch, but creating from something so that we'll have both more efficient creation and we'll see better content through that. Uh, we've been uh, establishing a new standard for interactive content and come a long way in that. Uh, yeah. So, so we're uh, very, very excited for the future where we think um, uh, we'll be seeing a lot better content online thanks to thanks to our new global collaboration platform. So if any of you want to learn more about H5P, you can go register on h5p.org and try out the authoring tool there. And we'll also guide you there to how you can start using it professionally. So thanks a lot for your time. Very interesting and very good. I need to say that uh, I like it and uh, I use it a lot uh, and we use it as a university for uh, creating interactive uh, examples of videos which, for example, we film during the lab, um, uh, any equipment, and then we add explanations and information and even graphs and links on it. So we really like it. Maybe an idea for Reinhardt, Martin, and Doug, why you don't put uh, H5P more at the core of MoodleNet? So, in fact, to create the community of H5P together with the Moodle Map community, because that will be good. <laughs> well, yeah. So, well, um, Spinetor and I have already uh, met in Barcelona to to talk about this, um, and I guess that as soon as we've done the hard work of getting Moodle Net out there. And something that people can use, and we'll follow up those Perfect, uh, discussions. Yeah. But you definitely know, something you, which we like to. You know me already. I already have crazy ideas, so that's my yeah. life. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, it's now we look forward to exploring how that can can be done. It it should be uh, it should be very strategically aligned. There shouldn't be anything stopping us from doing that getting the social context around it, and then H5P would bring yeah, very smooth anyway, ways yes, of because actually sharing resources. It's very good resources. to be able to share uh, those, as you said, to create uh, the YouTube for open educational resources mm -hmm. will be will be great. So, and I think uh, as videos are becoming so much the future, and in fact it is the present of, of uh, web, it will be also of the education. We are moving so much from uh, text mm -hmm. and uh, just simple PDF files in education on online learning systems uh, to videos and to interactive videos because our students nowadays that's what they like and that's what they want so we need somehow to adapt to the new uh, student generation. Thank you very much Vintor, I really appreciate it. So let's uh, uh, see you soon. So now we are moving to Professor Alfredo Soeiro who is coming from University of Porto and uh, he's a Eden Fellow for so many years, and he was also part of uh, the um, Eden Executive Committee for many years. And he's going to show us some very interesting examples of how to use immersive technologies, AR and VR, in, uh, in engineering, in fact. So, Alfredo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. I'm in the terrible spot of being between you and lunch for most of you, or, or at least for some. But um, I'll try to, to, to be quick. Um, in fact, um, what I'm talking is about the use of uh, open education technologies for something that uh, we haven't been done very much in the past, which is simulation. I think it's the great future of um, uh, the education technology, especially the open ones. Um, what I'm going to talk is about a, a project where I participate, which is um, uh, the title 
is a little bit long, but it's uh, construction safety education and training using immersive technology. So it just uh, started, it has three months, and um, we have a strong connection with um, the professional bodies in terms of uh, education, but we don't have yet with uh, people from e-learning and open education. We hope that uh, uh, Eden can participate as well as other members because I think that there is a great benefit for everyone if we use uh, more education technology, especially on what we are doing, which is simulation. I think that's the, the, the probably one of the uh, big successes of the open education technologies in the future. Um, and um, let me show a little bit what is the problem and how we are handling it. I'll be quick. So we have uh, different uh, target groups um, with different reasons, but uh, we go from the worker and the engineer to the construction owner and client. So there is a diversity of um, target groups that uh, may be interested in this simulation. A lot of people die in construction, in accidents, and it's very stupid and uh, uh, unacceptable for the 21st century. So what did we decide to do? We, we decided to use uh, some techniques that are available. Uh, BIM, I don't know if you know about it, but it's uh, 3D or 4D or 5D or whatever representation of um, any type of building or construction that we are using it and it's, um, uh, let's say, very detailed and has uh, most of the information needed uh, to prevent accidents. And we want to use um, uh, some gadgets that are useful for anyone, including the workers on the construction site, um, not only to be aware of the risks, but also for training. And for training, we have uh, use of um, 3D glasses, for instance, goggles and immersive reality. And um, because partners are experienced, some of them are experienced on one of these tools, some are experienced in more than one, but it, it is a, a very good group in terms of complementarity. Um, so th this is an example. Uh, I was in London uh, in the future build, and you can see there a, a, a simulation through Kong as a, a utility that it's a complete immersive uh, environment but we can have it also on the screen like I, I, I show here and you can use it on a smartphone or a tablet but the idea in terms of, um, of um, what we're going to do is to combine the training with the digital tools um, and uh, in terms of static approach we have some scenarios we have games for education and training and mostly we are betting uh, to be honest, on the simulation. We want to simulate the real environments before going there and um, before being dangerous. Um, the methodology that we are using is um, we, we have the tasks, we have the risks associated, and we want to visualize the environment, like I said, with different types of participation. But um, we want to make uh, the stakeholders uh, learn and be trained um, by anyone, and we want simple gadgets, not uh, not uh, very complicated, and um, of course, um, the, the, this is what we want to achieve. Um, we want this uh, project to be a facilitator on the user simulation for training and education. Um, it can be used on certification, like exams or professional uh, certificates that they can use on the construction sites. It has to be adapted. You know, I don't know if you know that any construction site is different from the previous ones, and it's um, really very difficult to handle. Um, we want to have some standardized uh, training, and we don't have much, mo much uh, money, just half a million euros, and we want to use it properly. And like I said, we want to use it on the site and on the training facilities, but um, I think the possibilities are immense. I think there is a lot of things to exploit for the people that are connected with e-learning um, and the new technologies to train and to educate uh, using these type of tools. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hello? Is my mic.
Is it okay? I was too quick. Thank you so much. You are always uh, just on time and just spot on. Um, so thanks a lot. Uh, that was very interesting. In fact, we are also running a lot of AR and VR, especially VR examples recently with uh, in engineering and uh, especially also in civil engineering. But in uh, we are running some examples on autonomous car uh, cars. So we are trying to pass them. With uh, with VR using the, some examples from some companies which are uh, doing some research uh, in uh, in Timișoara in the west of Romania region. Thanks a lot. So that was really good. So I'm looking forward for uh, some examples. As uh, we are a bit uh, later than uh, we said, uh, we will take some questions and discussions at the end. I have some ideas already uh, prepared for all the speakers. Now it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Carmen Holopescu. Professor Carmen Holopescu is a professor in computer science and the dean of computer science from another university from the same city where I am, from Timisoara in Romania. And uh, she used to be very famous for blogging and for tweeting, but she's becoming quite well known for known uh, now recently in uh, for her interest in blockchain and especially on using blockchain in education. So another possibility maybe for certification, for badges, uh, and for uh, recognition uh, in education. So Carmen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, uh, everyone. Thank you, Diana, for your uh, presentation. And thank you all for your uh, wonderful uh, speeches. So uh, now I propose you the topic of uh, blockchain. Uh, the studies show that blockchain is uh, one of the most difficult to understand concepts. But we'll see that uh, very soon each of us will uh, use uh, this uh, technology in our uh, activities and uh, in order to prove uh, our uh, knowledge and our uh, credentials. Uh, so um, I will start with uh, a very uh, brief introduction uh, for this uh, technology. Uh, maybe uh, most of you are familiar with uh, blockchain, starting uh, with uh, its application of uh, cryptocurrency. But uh, we, sh uh, we should see that um, this application, cryptocurrencies, are uh, just an application of blockchain, like uh, email is uh, for the internet, let's say. Uh, so, um, in 2009, this uh, term was coined by uh, the still unknown Satoshi Nakamoto as um, the term for um, the technology which uh, was at uh, the base of uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is um, the most uh, well-known uh, uh, blockchain platform, but uh, there are other uh, hundreds of uh, such uh, platforms, such as uh, Ethereum or Hyperledger, Quorum, Alastria or uh, Hedera, Hashgraph. Okay, blockchain is um, considered as one of the major technology of the past decade and uh, is a pillar of the fourth industrial revolution. Blockchain provides trust in information without using third parties, thus facilitating peer-to-peer -peer transaction platforms, uh, which leads to the creation of uh, new businesses and will represent an ongoing source of innovation and economic growth. We can see here the advantages of this technology and uh, also uh, a large variety of fields in which uh, this technology is uh, applied. It has the potential to disrupt a lot of uh, domains, one of them being uh, education. In Europe, blockchain is uh, considered to be a strategic technology. If uh, you'll follow the link I put uh, on this slide on uh, europa.eu, 
you can find um, a lot of information about uh, the project, the funding in this, this field, in this field, uh, the project. Uh, I would like to mention the fact that um, two years ago, in uh, March 2018, uh, the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum was launched. Um, it consists of two groups. One is um, for use cases uh, in this domain, and one is for uh, policies. Uh, it's a very um, um, active uh, organization. Um, the group will end uh, their uh, activity at the end of um, this month in uh, Brussels. And uh, new rep representatives from uh, the countries of uh, EU will be chosen to be part of the new observatory for the next years. Also, I uh, have to mention the fact that um, 29 countries signed uh, the partnership for uh, European blockchain, and we'll see that uh, this partnership has um, very interesting uh, projects concerning all the citizens of uh, EU. Uh, I will um, quote here some ideas of um, the European Parliament resolution about uh, blockchain in education, uh, ideas from uh, two years ago. We see here that um, there were stressed the potential of blockchain for verification of uh, academic uh, qualifications. Also, uh, the lack of knowledge about the potential of this technology, the need to adapt the curricula of uh, universities and of uh, educational institutions for this uh, technology. Um, now, um, I would like to draw your attention on um, this very important project of um, the partnership for uh, blockchain. Um, it's about uh, the infrastructure for uh, blockchain, European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, EPC, a project of this partnership started uh, one year ago. So we'll have at the level of uh, the European uh, Union such an um, infrastructure based on uh, different blockchain platforms. Last month, uh, this partnership uh, has chosen four use cases to be deployed, to be implemented on this uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's about uh, notarization of documents, validation of diplomas, European self-sovereign identity, and uh, trusted data sharing. So uh, it's very important for us that uh, very soon all the diplomas, all the um, certificates, uh, the credentials will be stored on um, blockchain. Uh, everyone will be able to prove uh, their skills and knowledge for uh, other um, uh, educational institutions, for uh, employers, employers. Uh, this in uh, a cross-border setting. Uh, if uh, you'll go on the link, which is uh, for this project on uh, Europe.eu, uh, you will uh, find uh, the possibility to uh, test already uh, these uh, four use cases. And uh, next month, other use cases will be chosen and uh, will be implemented uh, uh, by the countries uh, in the partnership uh, on this uh, infrastructure. Uh, also, I want to mention that um, the countries will um, run their uh, nodes on uh, this infrastructure, already seven of uh, the countries have uh, functional uh, nodes on this uh, Okay, so this is um, 
an European application for uh, blockchain in education. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, please go and browse the report, eight reports, uh, which were published by uh, uh, EU Blockchain Observatory on uh, their site. Also, it's um, a very interesting report called Blockchain Now and Tomorrow, uh, a study about blockchain in education by uh, Alex Greff and uh, Anthony Camilleri. And uh, very, uh, I think, two months ago, uh, on the knowledge area of uh, uh, observatory, was published another study related to blockchain and education. Uh, also, I think two weeks ago, uh, it was published uh, a study of uh, the Digital uh, Credentials um, Consortium. Um, and also, there is a group for uh, digital credentials at the level of uh, worldwide uh, web uh, consortium. Now, um, there are a lot, a lot of other um, applications of uh, blockchain in education. Uh, I quote um, the most uh, significant on this uh, slide. You can see that. Uh, uh, besides the digital uh, credentials, uh, there are applications for intellectual property management, for uh, funding tracking, for student payment, and also we can see pedagogical enhancement using this technology. As pioneers for uh, using blockchain in education, there are University of Nicosia, which uh, started uh, in 2014, the first uh, master in uh, blockchain. The first uh, course, the first MOOC is free for uh, everyone. They use uh, the Moodle platform for delivering this master uh, study, this master program. Also, uh, students um, who take part in this uh, program uh, receive uh, credentials on blockchain and also they can pay their tuition using uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, Open University from uh, UK has also a very active group in uh, blockchain. Uh, they have uh, a lot of studies and uh, projects. Uh, some of them are related to reputation networks. Uh, they have um, a uh, very important uh, project now, uh, which is uh, run with uh, other uh, institutions. Uh, it is called uh, PolyChain, related to digital credentials. And uh, the third pioneer uh, university is uh, MIT from United States. Uh, they have the well-known um, project which is open source for uh, digital credentials, uh, which is called um, Blockchart. Uh, and now uh, Blockchart uh, is run by a spin-off of this institution by a uh, learning machine. Which is interesting is the fact that uh, most of the blockchain applications and projects are open source, so we can learn from them, we can test, we can pilot them. I would like also to mention the fact that uh, Malta, which is called uh, the Blockchain Island, is the first nation state to deploy blockchain technology in education, issuing uh, digital uh, credential for all the levels of education. Uh, there are many universities uh, in which uh, the payment uh, by the students uh, can be made uh, in uh, cryptocurrencies. Also, there are uh, projects uh, in order to issue credentials for uh, informal learning or for uh, learning um, in MOOCs. Then, it's uh, a family of uh, applications. Uh, related to decentralized universities and uh, learning communities, and I uh, quoted here uh, the name of a few and uh, 
uh, their link. Um, what is interesting is the fact that um, on blockchain it is recorder the learning journey of uh, all the participants. Uh, these uh, applications uh, come with a reward system to stimulate user participation. So uh, participants uh, receive uh, tokens for their activities uh, such as uh, creating materials, uh, completing the courses, coaching, curation, evaluation, peer mentoring and uh, so on. Uh, the participants uh, can uh, use tokens in order to pay for uh, other uh, educational services and this way uh, a global ecosystem of teachers and learners and also employers uh, is created. Um, blockchain is uh, listed as uh, one of um, the most um, wanted uh, skill for uh, the jobs. Um, LinkedIn um, showed that blockchain uh, is uh, the job the most popular, uh, more popular than uh, cloud computing or uh, artificial uh, intelligence. There are a lot of um, career specializations uh, for blockchain, not only developers or analysts, but also um, you have to know uh, things related to machine learning, to law, in order uh, to apply uh, this technology and to obtain the potential, uh, the potential uh, it can uh, bring. Okay, uh, let's see now um, how uh, universities adapt their curricula to this uh, technology. Um, a report was published by uh, Coinbase uh, a few months ago that um, shows that um, in the world for uh, the top uh, 50, 50 universities, um, a number of, uh, I don't see the number there, uh, 56 I think, of uh, percentage of them offer um, courses related to crypto and uh, blockchain up from uh, 42 in uh, 2018. What's interesting is the fact that um, uh, 70 percentage of classes are in departments outside of computer science, including law, health, humanities, economics, and uh, so on. So it's the need for skills in this domain. Universities uh, try to adapt their curricula, and also there are a lot of MOOCs a lot of uh, free courses in which all of us can learn about blockchain. And I quoted here a few MOOCs. Uh, some are um, delivered by universities, some uh, by uh, student organizations, some of companies. Uh, and you can find more if you start from uh, the directories uh, for uh, MOOCs such as uh, Class Central or uh, MOOC List. Now at the end, um, just a few words about um, um, my activity and uh, the activity of uh, my uh, collaborators related to blockchain. At my university, we opened a center for open education and blockchain uh, five years ago. Uh, it was the first course for uh, blockchain programming, which I started uh, uh, three years ago. And also I designed uh, the first uh, system for uh, digital certificates on uh, blockchain on the Ethereum platform um, two years ago. Um, we, are, um, we are working now in uh, different projects uh, 
for uh, MOOC tokenization, for mobility, for uh, Tibetan uh, science. And um, what uh, I um, find to be uh, very useful and very important is the fact that uh, we can uh, teach uh, blockchain to our students if we learn blockchain. So um, we have a plethora of uh, MOOCs for uh, learning uh, blockchain. We, we have a lot of um, uh, learning communities and uh, communities uh, of practice uh, which uh, whom to share and to discuss and to find the common projects. And um, the best way to learn blockchain is uh, to use blockchain to test different projects and uh, to use um, uh, platforms which have infrastructure on uh, blockchain. And I would like to end uh, by inviting you, if uh, your uh, interest is uh, in this domain, to write for the special issue uh, related to blockchain and open education, which will be published by the well-known uh, journal called the uh, Future uh, Internet. So uh, this was my uh, presentation, and uh, of course, I'd like to now uh, your feedback, your questions, if you have. Thank you. You think I'm very up to date. In fact, uh, there were a lot of comments in the chat about the blockchain technology, and uh, I am there with uh, some of them, uh, which says that uh, blockchain technology uses a lot of energy and with uh, this, uh, all of these issues which are going around us, uh, the weather, at least in Europe, was very funny this uh, this winter. Um, we need to look also into that. Do you have an answer if that could be a possibility for not the adoption of blockchain, at least not in education sector? Yes. Oh, not to not adapt to blockchain adopt. because of the climate impact. Oh. Uh, okay, so um, platforms, the platforms of blockchain use different algorithms for consensus. Uh, the energy is needed for uh, the algorithm which is called uh, proof of work, but there are many other algorithms uh, which don't require such energy the energy, the resources are very low. Um, you can uh, have uh, all the platform on uh, your uh, computer, all the nodes. So um, Bitcoin and Ethereum use such high energy, but uh, the other technologies uh, don't. So uh, there is uh, proof of stake, which doesn't work, and Ethereum just started uh, to use this consensus algorithm. So this is not uh, this is not a real problem. That's very good. Thank you so much, Carmen. That was really interesting. Now we'll have about five minutes, uh, five to seven minutes of comments. And I really uh, would like to invite uh, Martin back, if he can, because uh, I think it's, uh, again, what Irina and John quite mentioned in the last uh, messages, uh, about the European education area, which is quite big, at least in Europe. Uh, sorry for the others, which are not part of the European Union. European Union has put a lot of stress recently on defining uh, initiatives uh, um, as uh, to build up uh, a better education for all the Europeans, and especially for higher education, the higher education, but also for the early childhood education. There are a lot of uh, challenges uh, defined. And probably technology, and especially open technology, should have uh, a say on this. Martin? Well, yes. <laughs> I'll stop there. No, I mean, yes. Uh, so uh, I, uh, some of the reasons I get, I think open technology in general is the stuff that works. You look at all of the dot coms out there, they're completely reliant on Linux. Um, you know, Amazon Web Services is 
all Linux. It's all open source software. Um, look at uh, the web itself, uh, the, the, the uh, Apache web servers that run things, uh, the, the standards like HTTP. Um, this is what's made all this technology. You know, all these phones are based on Unix. And um, it, it just works. So it's proven that it works. And to think otherwise, that, oh, no, now there's a better way, uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. And a, a lot of these initiatives that I see that uh, say we have the solution, it's running at this.org or this.com, it reduces trust. You don't have the trust. That, that .com or .org can go away. Uh, OpenEduChain.io isn't there right now. Um, and like it's, uh, it's just a common issue on the internet. So we have to try and build things so they are distributed. I, and I, I, I like uh, some of this uh, blockchain talk about distributed ledgers is good for some things, but I feel like it's, it's like one tool from a toolbox that's being applied to everything. Uh, and um, it's a bit of a, there's a bit of hype around it as well. So it, it makes sense to look carefully at are we using the advantages of blockchain correctly um, rather than just trying to add it to everything. Because I, I, I just see so many blockchain companies and products already disappeared because they didn't mean anything. So, uh, yeah. Um, I agree. I fully agree with you in a way. Yes, you are completely right. And I think the large of technologies quite have a future. I think they will influence the education. Uh, maybe I'm jumping a bit uh, uh, out of uh, things here, like uh, fintech technologies. At least in Europe, they were like uh, about five years ago, they were non existent. Everybody was laughing at the fintech technologies. And nowadays, just the idea of Revolut, how popular it is, at least in, in Europe, and how many people are using it uh, is, uh, is quite interesting. So we never know. But I strongly believe uh, that as we have, for example, Moodle and other tools for, um, let's say, uh, support of education, we should have a different system for certification and accreditation and for diplomas. Because at least in Europe, that's becoming quite a challenge. And it's becoming a big challenge also on uh, the terms of, uh, how to say, not faking it by validation and uh, by sharing it, at least in the European uh, uh, space where uh, you can go, live, work, and educate yourself freely in any country you want. So uh, I would like to have another question for Vitor, if he can, uh, if he's available. Like, um, I know that quite a lot of uh, H5P tools have a lot of interactivity, and I quite like the idea that uh, you uh, mentioned here that you are developing uh, some of them, especially for the for the kaleidoscope, if I remember right, or for the virtual tool. So, what's next on the pipeline? That is a secret. <laughs> so, so we're having a big conference in uh, May in Madison, Wisconsin, in the U.S. We have been uh, piling up. We have more than 10 new content types coming. We have huge new uh, features that uh, will impact everything coming, and it will all be launched in, in Madison in May. So uh, come there and you'll see. And in fact, if we are speaking about uh, invitation, let's invite everybody to go to uh, Moodle.net. Uh, we share here the link and uh, try, try it. Obviously, we're all quite familiar with Moodle. I don't think we need more incentive of uh, going and joining Moodle, maybe to join the open at tech uh, global community for quite a lot of us which are working with technology every day. And uh, let's uh, look at what H5P has uh, next in line. And from my position as uh, Eden Vice President, I, I would like to invite you to the next uh, webinars. One is starting in half an hour from one. I have also presentation there, so that's a, a bit of advertisement, uh, if you allow me. Then we have another one on tomorrow about the textbooks on open world with some very interesting uh, findings and uh, information there. 
and on Friday about the micro learning and the quality of lifelong learning in the digital age. But the biggest invitation which I would like to make is for the Eden 2020 annual conference, which is uh, happening in Timisoara, in my city, in uh, uh, the next uh, in June. Let's hope that the virus is not really hitting us and we will still be able to um, to join and to be able to meet in person. Martin Togiamas is one of the keynote speakers among uh, Demetra Samson and Rebecca Wilson. And we have two more news, uh, two more speakers, which we are going to announce uh, quite soon. The deadline for submission is still open until the end of this month. And uh, the papers are going to be indexed. So please, educators, join us. And it's also an open call for a PhD symposium, which has proven recently to be very popular and very successful as it gets together students uh, with mentors. And we are trying to support the, the next uh, generation. If you have anything else to say, I'm inviting all the presenters. If not, anybody else? Marty, you have the mic on, so please, yes. Well, just a pleasure uh, to be involved and uh, talk to everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and for those who don't know me, I know I sound Australian, but I'm half <laughs> Greek, half German, and we have an office in Spain, and I feel very European. <laughs> so I, I think when I look at the world, all of the all of the most interesting, humanistic, open, uh, just the best thinking in this area is is happening in Europe the most, and it's kind of the centre of this uh, sort of open thinking, and I, I love that. So thank you very much. Working. That's very nice uh, for you to say. You're welcome anytime in Europe, and. Uh, so that's nice. So thank you everybody from Australia, Perth, to Norway, to Portugal, to Great Britain, to Romania, and also to participants from all the corners of the world. We've had participants from all the four continents. Uh, so that's amazing and great. Thank you all for taking your time for this webinar and see you at the next event. And please use technology responsibly. Thank you. Bye.